many of you know that your words matter? Words matter. Words are important. We live in a society today that you can, t- you can have a longer prison sentence for things you say than things you do. Come on, am I right? I can say things that might be hateful or derogatory towards someone, and it could put me in jail longer than if I physically hurt someone or steal something or even kill someone. Because words matter. And I think today in our society, we've taken words a little bit too crazy. We, we've, gone off, we've gone overboard a little bit with words. And we're into defining what, new or what, what traditional words mean. We're into putting a new definition on those. And so there's certain words that we're afraid to say in certain places. But I know that words matter. There's a little poem that we used to hear when we were kids. that said, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Do you remember that? I want to change it a little bit. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can break my heart. Right? The things that you say matter. Hey, listen, the words that Jesus said mattered. Jesus could say just a few words and it would change things. Let me give you an example. When he walked into a cemetery and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And all of a sudden, that... that corpse that was laying there that was wrapped in, 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 in his grave clothes, he, he came to life and he came out. I've heard preachers say, why did he say Lazarus? Because if he had just said, come forth, every dead body in the world would have sprung up at that point. Because there's power in the words that we say. When Jesus was on a boat with the disciples and a, a storm came blowing in and the disciples were were afraid. They were going crazy. They were throwing things overboard. They were trying their hardest to hang on. They thought that they were going to die. And let me tell you, it was on the Sea of Galilee. Anybody ever been on the Sea of Galilee? Have you? I have. Yeah, some of you. I've been on the Sea of Galilee. I know what that's like. It's not even as big as probably Keystone Lake, all right? It's not that big. And I don't know if they're being overdramatic or what, but I've been on some, I've been on some storms on some lakes that didn't scare me. I, we went on a cruise and there was a storm came in and I thought I was going to lose my wife. I mean, she, she does not like that motion and there's something different about those waves. But the disciples were freaking out and they, they got down and they woke Jesus up because he was in the bottom of the boat asleep. He was just sleeping down there, chilling, having a good time. He wasn't worried about it. Jesus, do you not even care if we perish? And he got up and all he did was say, be still. And the winds and the storms and the waves obeyed him just with his words. Words matter. Words matter if they're used the right way. Even if they're used the wrong way, words can still matter. God used his words to create the world. He used his words to separate darkness from light, to separate land from sky. He used his words to to create to create animals and to create plants and create birds. He used his words to do all of that stuff. Words matter. And this morning, we're going to talk about what it means to have words that matter. And do your words matter? And I want you to know your words matter. About 30 years ago, I got down on one knee at a a restaurant and I, no, I wasn't at a restaurant. We were at my house, weren't we? And I asked Lisa to marry me. I gave her a ring to marry me. And she said one word that changed my life. What was it? No, she said maybe. She said maybe. Let me see your bank account is what she said. Let me see your checkbook. I want to see. No, I'm kidding. She said yes. And it changed my life. We were in the doctor's office one time and the, 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 the ultrasound tech came in and she said, okay. It's twins, and that changed our life. Do you know, anybody know what you're talking about? It changed our life when we had twins. Everything changed. Words matter. Here in this scripture, we see that words matter. And James is, man, James is hard-hitting. He doesn't pull any punches. He just gets right to it. And James is going to talk to us this morning about why words matter. So I want you to look at James, the third chapter, and I'm going to start reading in the New International Version. I'm going to start reading in the first verse. It says this, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers or sisters, because you know 
that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into our mouths, into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or we take ships as an example. Although, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Wow, that's a powerful statement. Verse number seven. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no one, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord the Father and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praises and cursings. My brother, this should not be. Can both flesh, fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Now, James, very typical in his writings here as we've gone through this, he'll, he'll, have, a, he'll have a statement and then he'll give illustrations of that statement. He'll have one thesis that he has for these different sections and then he'll have a series of examples that he explains them. We've gone through in these last few weeks and we've heard some pretty pointed, strong things from James. In fact, last week, we, we talked about what it is to be a real Christian. How do you know that you're a real Christian if you have faith in your life? But how do you know if you have faith? Faith has actions to it. You need to do something. And if you act, if you have actions, you have faith. In fact, I, and, and I'm not meaning to go back and re-preach this from last week, but I went back and as each week I go back and kind of review what I did. And this last verse, number 26, I don't have it on the screen, forgive me. It's just come to me right now. But verse number 26, I love what this last verse of chapter 2 says because it says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. As the body without the spirit, that word spirit is the, is the, the Greek word that we, that's, that's pneuma. The Hebrew word is ruach. It's the word for spirit. This is a small s. We're not talking about the spirit of God, but we're talking about the spirit in man, the breath of man. As a man has breath, if he has breath, he's alive. Does that make sense to you guys? If you don't have breath, you're not alive. You got it? You got it? Are you breathing right now? Some of you need to check, all right? Because some of you have just been sitting there. If, you're, if someone next to you is dead, please let us know so that we can pray for him or whatever. I don't know what we're going to do. Not spiritually, but physically. You know what I'm talking about. But in the same way, he says, then faith without deeds is dead. Do you have faith or do you have deeds in your life? Not faith. I don't need to see your faith. I need to see your deeds. If you have deeds, then I know you have faith in the same way is what the scripture says here. Well, now he changes it a little bit and he comes into this area and gets more specific and starts talking about our tongue. Our tongue shows what's in our hearts, what's in our lives. So as we speak, it shows it's a reflection of what's inside of our lives. What I say out loud is a reflection of what comes in, inside my lives. Your words can control lives, it can destroy lives, or it can build lives up. It's all up to you. You are the ones that's going to make the choice this morning of what your words do. Jesus, brother James, he he starts out by giving a strong warning and he gives a strong warning to those who are teachers. He gives a strong warning to those who always want to be the ones that are leading and teaching and using their wisdom that comes out of their mouth. But he says to us, when we teach, we open ourselves to more scrutiny than other people do. When we teach, we're held to a higher accountability than everybody else is. I'm very careful and I'll just say this to you personally. I'm very careful about who I put on stage up here and allow to speak. I'm very careful about it. 
I get people who call me all the time who want to come by and want to do a service or missionaries and different things. If I don't know them, if I don't know their heart, I know people who come in and they, they have great ministries and preach to thousands of people, but I don't, I don't, I, I'm not sensing in their heart that they have an honest, sincere heart. So I'm not going to have them come in. I want people who come in with a heart that's pure, that can speak to you, and that we are able, in some ways, we're scrutinizing who they are by the lives that they lead. So what James is saying here, he's saying, listen, you need to make sure that your life, if you're up in front of people, you need to make sure that your life represents who Christ is, and that your life is going to be held to a higher level of scrutiny than everybody else, because words matter. And I'll just say to you guys, if I have said something from the front or from the pulpit sometimes that have offended you and I've done it in a wrong manner, I apologize. It's not typical of my ministry. I've been doing this a long time. It's not typical of my ministry that I have to go back and apologize for things that I've said, but it happens. But I want you to know, I want to speak to you guys out of a heart that's open, out of a heart that's honest. I don't know where all of you guys come from, but I know human nature, and I could speak towards human nature, and we are all sinners saved by grace. Can I get an amen from somebody in this place? So we all come to it that way. When we teach, we are opening ourselves up to, to, to more scrutiny. Luke 12, 48 says, from everyone, who has been, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much will be asked. So if God has given you talents, if he's given you abilities, he will ask you to use those for him. This is maybe one of the most used verses my mom used to use on me when I was a kid growing up, all right? Because she would always say, if God gave you talent, you need to use it for him. And I didn't want to do it. And she said, you need to do it or God will take it away from you. It's usually what happened. And I usually ended up singing or doing what she wanted me to do because she was mom and that's the way that goes. Verse number two here says, back in James, verse number two says, we all stumble in many ways. If, everyone is never, if anyone is ever, never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. Yet no one's perfect. Anybody in here ever offended someone with something they said? Can I see a hand? All right, some of y'all aren't being honest. Now let's try this one more time. We're in church. We're in church. Has anybody ever offended somebody and you had to apologize for something you've said? That ought to be 100% of us. If, if someone's not raising their hand, give them up. Let's pray for them, all right? Yes, every one of us have. Well, what he says here, if anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. Well, all of us fail all of that because we are not perfect. We say things and we have never been able to keep our whole body in check all of our lives, all right? So let's just be honest with each other here. So this is for us. In other words, James is saying, this message is for you. In fact, I want you to understand that the world looks at us and sees us and scrutinizes us different than they do everyone else. They're looking for someone who is perfect, and we are not the people who are perfect. In fact, we are sinners saved by grace. When I get up in front of you, I have to understand something. I have got to teach you what I know. I can't teach you something I don't know. I can't teach you something that I don't live because I can see you out there laughing and saying, bro, you don't exercise. I can tell from here, them skinny arms and skinny legs. You know? Now, we got some boys in here that exercise, and you can look at them and tell, those boys, are, they're exercising, all right? They're, they're doing it right because they're all pumped up. And then you see, you know, guys like me that shape like a light bulb, you know? And some of us are just that way. So it's important that what I say I can live out in my life because if I can't, I'm a hypocrite if I say something and I can't live it. Amen. Are you with me? The church is filled with people who say one thing and live another. I See how quiet you got right there? The church is filled with people who say one thing and they live another. And the world is filled with people who are watching us that when we say one thing and we do something else, or when we say, I go to church, but we're hitting the clubs and the disco. They don't have discos anymore, do they? they <laughs> the clubs and the festivals and all the stuff on the weekends, and then they hear you say that you go to church. They're looking at you and going, hmm, 
So that's what Christians are like. No! It's not. When we choose to live this Christian life, we choose to surrender our lives to God, our entertainment, our pleasures, our indulgences. We choose to focus on Jesus and understand that what he can give me is better than what the world gives me. Can I get an amen from somebody in this place? Y'all help me preach this morning, will you? Will you help me preach it? We'll get through this a lot quicker if you'll help me a little bit. Thank you. Oh, I love that. Then, and now everybody's just, oh, amen, Pastor. Every word I say, I'm going to get it. And I'm fine with that. I don't mind that at all. But I'm just wanting to say to you guys, it's important that we live who we are because the world is watching. It's impossible for us to control our whole body, but we know that with God's help, we can do it. Proverbs 18.21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The, the body, the, the tongue has the power of life and death. Now, in some circles, we've taken that, I think, a bit too far. But the important thing to understand here is that our words matter. Now, here's another one in, in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, and this is in the New Living Translation. It says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training him to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I, might, I myself might be disqualified. I don't want to live my life and find out at the end that I was living a lie. Amen? I don't want to preach the word and preach the gospel to you and then find out that I'm being disqualified because of the things I was preaching I wasn't living. I want to live out what I know in my life. I want to live those things out. So the things we say with our mouth matter. They matter to you. They matter to me. They matter to all of us. So James, through this portion of scripture, he takes six kind of pictures for us of illustrations, and he puts them in three categories, and, I, and I'm going to hit those for you this morning. So here we go. Number one is the tongue controls. The tongue controls. Look here at verse number three. When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder Whenever the pilot want, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boats. Now, he uses two examples here. He uses the, the bit of a horse, and he uses the rudder of a ship. I want you to see on both of these things, both of these things control the animal, but we are the ones that control it, all right? So what he's talking about here is our tongue can control other things, but we are the ones that are in control of our tongue. These are both things that we control. And as we control them, we need to make sure that we're doing them in a right way because the words you say can be destructive or they can build up. And James is giving us the warning here for most of this part that they can be destructive. Luke 6.45 says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, but an evil man brings evil things uh, out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. All right? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Have you ever had someone that says something and they come back and say, I, you know what, I didn't mean that. I shouldn't have said that. That's not, that's not in my heart. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you wouldn't have said it if it wasn't in your heart. Right? The problem is, is that we sometimes get our heart mixed up with our head. We say things out of our head instead of th saying things out of our heart. We say things because we're angry, because we're fed up, because we just need to say it or because we haven't learned to discipline our mouth, we say them right out of our head when they need to come from our heart because the things in the heart are who we are. The things in our heart are from our lives. I get tired of these celebrities who are always talking about, you know, uh, that's not who I am. I said this years ago, but that's not who, they never apologized, but they just said, that's not who I am. I'm different today. Well, that may be the truth, but it had to be who you are or you wouldn't have come out of your, uh, out of your heart and out of your mouth. Resentment begins in the mouth, but eventually, I mean, the heart, but it eventually comes out of the mouth. You hear that? Resentment begins in your heart, but it eventually comes out of your mouth. What is in your heart will flow out of your mouth. That's just the way that goes. It may be not who you are, but from what you said, it is. There are four things, there are four types of people I put down here. Listen to this. Those who think before they talk, those who think as they talk, those who talk and then think, 
and those who talk and don't think, <laughs> amen? I don't know which category you are on that, but hopefully you're one of the, the, the first two, all right? We need to make sure that we think before we talk. I am a, I am a, I am a talker and a thinker at the same time. I, I think as I talk. That's the way I'm, I'm put together. But many times I have to stop and think before I talk because some of the things I say can be hurtful to other people. Have you ever said someone say, I just, that, I, I just said that right off the top of my head? Have you ever heard that, right? What they need to say is, instead of saying things from the top of your head, you need to say things from the bottom of your heart. I meant that from the bottom of my heart. And you know that means that, that someone's really serious, right? What James is letting us know here is that we have to be careful with the things that we say because the things that we say can hurt the people who are around us. Did you know that your heart can think? I know we have some doctors in here that you might disagree with me on this, but hang with me. Did you know that your heart can think? Let me, let me show you some scriptures here. Proverbs 23, 7, and this is from the New King James. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Okay, let me give you another one. Y'all are awful quiet. Hebrews 14, 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. You guys know this one. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges, listen to this, the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Right? Matthew 19, or 15, 19 says, For out of the heart comes evil, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false intentions, and slander. So our heart has control of who we are, and we can think with our hearts. And the last one here in Genesis, the sixth chapter, it says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of man's, uh, of human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination, inclination of the thought of the human heart was only evil. So we see lots of examples about human hearts. I, I found this illustration. Um, Pastor Robert Morris had shared this, and I thought it was interesting. Um, it, this is from a medical review, an actual medical review that they did a story on this or a paper on this, and let me read you part of this. It says, when some heart transplants patients had received their new heart, they found out that the previous owner had donated a few eerie thoughts as well. Listen to this. After recovering from their operation, several, several recipients started recounting incidents that had occurred in the lives of their donors. Dun, 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 dun. We need a little dramatic music here, don't we? Kind of, listen to this. A 52-year-old man who loved classical music after being given the heart of a 16-year-old teenager suddenly discovered that he enjoyed rock music. Wow, what would that be like, all right? Listen to this. A man who had received a heart from a woman that, been, that had been hit by a train after he recovered had dreams about train wrecks. Not convinced? Okay, let's keep going. After a young boy received his heart transplant, he awoke and told his mother, everything is copacetic. He had never used that phrase or that word before, but later learned that the donor and his wife would use that phrase to re reassure each other after they'd been in a fight. Wow. Okay, one more, one more. Are you ready? Okay, this is, this is impressive here. After an eight-year-old girl had received a heart transplant of a murdered child, she started having recurring nightmares. She described circumstances of her donor's death and the killer's description in such detail that the police were able to take her information and capture the murderer who was later convicted. From a heart transplant. Now, I don't understand that. Dr. Chris, you might be able to explain that to us. I don't know. But I'm just saying, what we say and what we think matters in our life. And we can control it. Number two is this. The tongue destroys the tongue destroys. Look back down here at verse number five. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil, evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it itself is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. 
but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of poison. Now, it's interesting here because he uses two more illustrations. He talks about a spark, and then he talks about animals. And with the spark, he says that a small spark can start a flame. It only takes a spark. Remember that, uh, the, all of you, to ma make a fire, to keep a fire burning or whatever. Back in the day, we remember those songs. Yeah, a spark is all it takes to start the fire. In fact, the, we've got great history of these things happening. The, the, the fire that happened in California just was it last year, a few years ago, the largest forest fire that California ever had started from just a spark. A spark can start small, but it can grow into a great thing. I've got a story here. The fire began in just a small spark, but it can grow to destroy a city. A fire reported, reportedly started in the O'Leary Barn in Chicago at 8.30 p.m. on October 8th, 1871. None of you were around, I hope. And because the fire spread, over 100,000 people were left homeless 17,500 buildings were destroyed and 300 people died. It cost the city over $4 million and that was in 1871. It's the great fire in Chicago. If you've ever been up to Chicago or read about that, it was a great fire. It started with just a spark. Sometimes the words that you say can start a chain reaction in the life of someone else that destroys them like a fire would destroy a city or a fire would destroy a country. Just the words that you say are sharp and can hurt and can penetrate. So we have to be careful with the things that we say. And we can't say the wrong things because it can hurt the people who are around us. It's very important that, we, that, that, that we're careful with that. I, when I was a youth pastor, we used to do an illustration. This was back, we could get away with a lot more back then, you know. We did Chubby Bunny back then. We can't do that nowadays in the youth group. If any of you guys ever remember that game. But we would do an illustration, we would we'd get a, a pretty good-sized teenager up on stage and have him put his arms out like this, and then I'd have two people on either side push down his arms and have him resist, and most of the time he could resist pretty, pretty well. And then while we were pushing down his arms, someone would say something like an insult to him, like, your hair really looks funny, or you've got a big zit on your nose, or whatever, you know, something that was actually true, and it kind of hurt the kid's feelings, so I stopped doing that. But what happened is as soon as you said that, what happened is they could push his arms down because he began to lose strength because of what was said to him. And it's a great visual illustration for us to understand. The things that you say to people can encourage them or discourage them, right? You are either pouring courage into someone or you're taking courage out of someone. And many times with the things that we say to other people, we cut them down, we put them in their place, we won the battle, but you lost the war. You may walk away saying, man, I told them, ah, I am so cool. I can't believe I thought of that all on my own. I got them. They'll never say that to me. But the problem is, is that you so destroyed that person's life that you injured them like a fire would start in their life and it begins to burn. And even after you've walked away, that stayed with them. That stayed with them. I had an incident here a few years ago that I had a couple of guys that were in our youth group, uh, our youth pastor, and, and I think Eli was even in, in the group. And we had done some things over at ORU, and it didn't go quite the way I had planned it. And I just made some, some quick, snide remarks to them, just passive-aggressive to them, and didn't, went, didn't think about it. And a couple of days later, my youth pastor came to me and said, Pastor, those things that you said, they, I took that home with me. And I mean, I felt about that big. And I had to apologize to both of those guys. I pulled them together and apologized to them because, yeah, I... I, I spoke too quickly, I spoke out of line, and I knew at that point I needed to ask for forgiveness and reverse those things because what I said was hurtful. It made me feel good. I got some things off my chest. I spoke off the top of my head. You hear what I'm saying? And I should have spoken from the bottom of my heart. And y'all, I'm just saying I'm still susceptible to this. I'm not perfect. I still struggle with the things that I say because when I was a kid, I talked all the time. I was the big mouth in the group. 
My mom called me Freddy the Frog because there was a story about a Freddy Frog that always talked, and that's what she talked to me. She told me I had diarrhea of the mouth. <laughs> she thought I was going to be a lawyer. Oh, sorry, Mom. I'm just a preacher, you know. <laughs> she just knew that whatever you're going to be doing, it's going to be doing with your mouth because you talk all the time. And I've had to work to get that thing in control. The last thing, that, that, the next illustration that, that James talks about here, he talks about it being a poison. The tongue can be a poison. We can, we can tame any kind of animal. We can put them down. But he says no man can tame the tongue. And he says the tongue is like a deadly poison. It, it's like that poison that gets inside of you. If something bites you and it spreads all the way through your body, that's the way it does. Because things that we say affect our heart. I'm going to go into the last one here. Because you guys look like you're ready for me to go into the last one. The tongue, this is the good news here. The tongue can also build up. It can also build up. You guys, I hope I put this one in. I may not have. But let's look at verses 9 through 12. This is with the tongue we praise our God the Father. And with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Let me just stop right there for a second. You remember last week we talked about, and the week before, we talked about how important it was to love our brothers and sisters because they were made in God's likeness. They are God's children. Well, here, James carries this continuing over here, and he says, listen, with the same tongue that you love your father, you curse men who have been made in God's likeness. You curse men who are God's children, who are your brothers and sisters. You curse people, you may have a disagreement with them, but they are still God's children. He's emphasizing that again here. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursings. My brother, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. And what he's saying here is if you say you're a Christian, then you have to get your mouth in line with Christianity. I've heard people say the last thing to get saved is your wallet. Amen? When someone begins to give and support the church, you know that they're really saved because they're giving. But I want to say, for a lot of us, the last thing that gets saved is our tongue because our tongue is the thing that reveals what's in the heart. And if we can't use our tongue in a positive way, then can you at least switch and use it? And if you can't, if you can't use it in a positive way, could you switch and stop using it in a negative way? And instead of cursing someone, build someone up. I would like for you to be the person, instead of when you walk in the room, everybody goes, oh, 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 nobody, nobody, nobody say anything. Nobody, watch out. Here comes that person who's always got that sharp tongue, who's always trying to be funny, who's always trying to cut everybody down, who's always trying to show you how great they are. Instead, could we be those people that when someone comes in a room and you come in the room and say, oh, come over here and talk to us. I love talking to her because she's always so uplifting. She's always so positive. She always has a blessing. She always has a kind thing to say to someone. She always just has this thing about her that's always inspirational. I love talking to her because you encourage me every time I talk to you. Wouldn't you rather be that person than the one that comes in and says, man, I'm going to show everybody what's going on, and I'm going to be funny, and I'm going to do all this? Forget about being funny. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you're spreading the love of Christ and the people that you come in contact with. Are you with me this morning, y'all? Y'all are quiet. Here, again, James talks about two polar opposites. He talks about fresh water and bitter water. He talks about the good things we say and the bad things we say. But I want, to, I want you to know, the real problem he's talking about here is not the tongue. The real problem is what's the condition of the human heart. Because if the human heart is in the right space, it controls what your tongue says. Are you with me? Isn't that the truth? I want, I want you to come back and look at two verses here, and then we're going to go back up. We're going to look at them. Look at this one, verse number six. The tongue also is a fire, word of evil. Um, it corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of life on fire. Listen to this. And is itself set on fire by hell. The tongue is set on fire by hell. Set on, the tongue set on fire the tongue is set on fire. I have heard that somewhere else before in this Gospels. The tongue was set on fire. Oh, yeah. On the day of Pentecost, Scripture says that there was the sound of a rushing mighty wind, 
and fire came down from heaven like cloven tongues of fire and lit upon each person. Holy Spirit controls our tongue. When we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we have a new language. Our tongue is surrendered to the Lord. Maybe that makes more sense now. That what he's talking about here is that people who are controlled by hell can't control their tongue. But when we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, now we have the ability to surrender our language and our vocabulary. Oh, no, no. It's not just that. We're surrendering our heart to the Holy Spirit. We're taking, our Holy, we're taking our heart and giving it to the Holy Spirit and saying, Holy Spirit, whatever you want to say through me, you say, I will completely yield to you. And let me tell you, just like Scripture is saying here, if you can yield your tongue to the Lord, your heart's already there. Amen? Can you get, I, amen? That was a good place to say an amen right there. And then this last Scripture, but no man can tame the tongue. Look at verse number eight. It says, but no man can tame the tongue. We can tame all kinds of animals, but we can never tame the tongue. No man can tame the tongue. No man, no man, but God can. He is the only one that can help you with your tongue. He's the only one that can rescue you. He's the only one that can solve this issue of your life. I love that scripture because it helps us understand that when God comes in and when you surrender your life to him and when you surrender your heart and your tongue to him, he will completely change your life. Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus was continually surrendering himself to the Father. He was continually saying, Lord, if not my will, but thine be done. He was continually saying to God, listen, I submit to you. I surrender to you. Whatever you want is what I'm going to do. He, he was continually going and blessing people with his tongue, wasn't he? Yes, he cursed some people, but they needed to be cursed. When Peter decided that he was going to judge Jesus and try to give Jesus some direction in his life, Jesus came back and said, get, the, get thee behind me, Satan. He he cursed him. He rebuked Peter. He needed to rebuke Peter because Peter decided that he was going to exalt himself over Christ and he was going to give Christ instruction. You're not going to go to the cross. You're not going to do this. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. You don't know what's in my mind or my heart. Jesus did that, but Jesus needed to do that. But 99.999% of the time, he was blessing people and encouraging people and telling people, you're forgiven. Go and sin no more. He was telling people, listen, what you've done is not who you are. But when you are forgiven, when you come into that lordship of Jesus Christ, all of that completely changes. Because he wants us to be encouragers and uplifters instead of people who are always cursing and pushing people down. Amen? Are you with me? Paul, come up, bro. He does it all. He plays keys, he preaches, and he plays the drums, he does it all. Let me, let me, I'm going to end with this. Years ago. Okay, listen. I apologize that God only speaks to my wife through the grandchildren or dogs, all right? <laughs> but that's the way. Ever, she always has a story about grandchildren or, or our dogs. And, and the grandchildren I can understand. And the dog I can understand. The Lord tells me a lot of stuff about him too, but it's not positive. <clears throat> he keeps giving me words like kennel. Dog catcher. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. When when we were um, when we were just married, we lived in Norman, and we had, we had moved down there to to start a church in Norman. We started a church in our living room in Norman. We left the assembly here in Broken Arrow. Had a youth group, one of the largest in the state. But God called us to go to Norman to start a church, so we drove down there and started a church. We were kind of down there by ourselves in a lot of ways. And we hadn't been married but just a few years. We had a bunch of kids to show for it. But I remember one specific time that I don't know what the circumstance was, what happened, but we got into an argument. I remember, I don't remember what we got into an argument about, but there are parts of the argument that I'll never forget. And we were, in, we were in an argument discussing something, and she's not an arguing type. She's pretty quiet, but she didn't like something, and so she voiced it to me, and I got mad. 
And I made a comment to her that when it came out of my mouth, I knew I shouldn't have said it. Come on, can somebody else have, uh, will y'all help me? Will y'all nod or something here? As soon as it came out of my mouth, it wasn't even halfway out my mouth, and I thought, you shouldn't have done that. And it shut her up. In fact, she ducked her head and started crying. You know, I guess I could have thought, man, you, cho- you told her, showed her who's boss. She's never going to do that again. You won. That's not how it affected me. Because when I looked at her and I saw those tears coming down her eyes, with those words, I basically gutted her. I basically stripped her of everything that she was. She's a new mom. She's a new pastor's wife. She's trying to figure this thing out herself. She's trying to raise four kids and keep me happy and build a church and meet new people and all these things are going on in her life and something happens and I got to say something that just absolutely ripped her. She didn't say anything else and I stood there just watching her as she went back to doing the dishes or whatever she was doing with big tears coming down her face and then she walked out of the room. And I thought to myself, you're an idiot, number one. You're an idiot. You've never been able to control your mouth. And now look what you've done. I went in and she had gone to the bedroom. And I went in and found her. And I put my arms around her and said, I forgive, or forgive me for saying that. But it didn't go away. It lingered in her. I could tell it lingered in her. And then I, as the husband, as the priest of my home, I had to find it within my heart and ask the Holy Spirit to guide me in helping me to navigate through that and reassure her that she wasn't what I said she was. But I had to encourage her and reassure her. And I did something else. I had to go back to my prayer time and I said, Lord, really? Is this who I am, the great man of God that destroys your family by the things that you say because I can't control my mouth? Really? And I just said, Lord, I've got to give that to you too. I get to give you my mouth, my heart. I get to give you everything, my desires, everything I have, Lord. I want to give to you because I don't want to go through that again. And there may be of times that I still have said something every once in a while. She'll tell you about it, though. That's the thing about having a pastor's wife. I become a sermon illustration for her times of, you know, she comes up and tells stuff on me now. But I've had to surrender my heart and my tongue to her because here's one thing I know. I can't tame my tongue. Only God can. But one thing I can do is I can choose to let my words be encouragement to people and lift people up and build people up instead of allowing my words to tear people down. Because Jesus needs us, listen to this, Jesus needs us to be his hands extended to the world, his voice extended to the world, his arms extended to the world. He needs us to be to be little people with with little, you know, guys, little persons with, with Jesus skin on, that when we walk into a place, we can spread the love of Christ that's, that maybe not there in some of the places you go to. And Jesus wants to transform that in you this morning. He wants to transform that in you. So I want to ask you guys to stand with me, would you please? And I want to ask you to to just bow your heads for just a second. We're going to pray. I I like doing it this way because I'm not interested in pulling people out or embarrassing anybody, anything like that. But I just want to say to you this morning, are are you here and you need to surrender your, your tongue to the Lord? You need to surrender the things you say to the Lord. 
You need to say, Lord, I haven't fixed that part of me yet. I need that to be fixed. I need you to take my vocabulary and fix it. I lay that on the altar this morning and I give that part of my life to you because I want to be an encourager instead of someone who's always tearing things down. You may not be a specifically negative person, but man, you've you've got some words that you've heard and they just come out too quickly, too easily. Sometimes you can't control that part of your your voice or your, your mouth. And I just want to pray for you this morning. But I need you first to say, yeah, that's me. That's me. So with head bows and eyes closed, because I don't want you to, I, I want to give you every opportunity to raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me. We're going to pray for you. And then we're going to let you go so you can go about your day. But if you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, that's me. I'm going to confess it. I, I, need to, I need to lay that on the altar. Yep, yep. Come on. If that's you, just raise your hand real quick just so I can see it. Come on. Okay, I see you. I see you. Yep. Okay, you can put them back down. Lord Jesus, I want my words to give life to people. I want to represent you when I walk into a room or into a party or into a a place of work or into my school. I want to represent you. So Lord, this morning I surrender to you my mouth, my tongue, my brain, but mostly I surrender to you my heart because I know that that's where all of it stems from. Lord, I pray that you would help me to be able to have words that lift people up and encourage them and build them up instead of words that tear down and destroy. Father, if there's some hurt in my heart that that's stemming from, then Lord, would you deal with that hurt? If there's unforgiveness, would you deal with that unforgiveness? If there's bitterness, would you deal with the bitterness? If there's pain just from life, would you deal with that, Lord? And Father, I know that when you deal with that, the words will take care of themselves because it's the human heart and it's my heart that you really want to take care of. So Lord, I I give that to you. I I give you my heart. I give you my actions. Lord, I make a new commitment and make a new surrender to you. And I know, Lord, that when I do that, that it's going to be in your hands now. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, are you all all right? That was kind of a... That was a, a difficult message because I didn't want to all stay negative with it. I wanted to find a positive thing to it. Listen to me for a second. You guys represent Christ everywhere you go. Okay? You represent Christ everywhere you go. When you go to places, know that when you walk in there, you're representing the church, you're representing Christ because they know that you attend church. The kids that you hang out with, the people that you work with, your family, they know that you go to church. They know that when you're here, Don't just come and let things roll off and then you go home and there's no change. When you come to church, come ready for surgery. Come ready to be gutted. Come ready to get the stuff out of my life that I, if 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 church is a second thought to you, then God's gonna take you through some times in your life when you don't have some things so that you're gonna focus back on the importance of being around people who are Christians. Some of you are gonna have to go through some tough times before you can get over the stuff that you think that you enjoy that bring fulfillment. But the things that really matter in life are the people who I'm around and me representing Christ to those people and helping them to be the very best people they could be. So that's what I want you guys to do this week. The people who are around, encourage them, lift them up, help them to be the very best people that they can be. And when you do, you're acting more like Christ than any other time because you're putting hope and help and restoration of those people who you're around. All right, will you do that? Lord, thank you for these people. I pray that your blessings will be upon them. Lord, I pray that as we go out today, that we would be the hands of Jesus extended to the world. Wherever we go to eat, whatever we go to do, Lord, we represent you. So let us go in the name of the Lord. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here.